Hello friends, my name is Pastor Jesse. I'm here at Peckway Church in Whitehorse, which is in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Think right in the middle of Harrisburg, PA and Philadelphia, PA, about an hour east of Philly, about an hour west to Harrisburg. And we exist to help people know and follow Jesus. We do that through a number of ways. Primarily, we have our Sunday morning worship services at 9 a.m. where we preach the word, where we sing the word through authentic worship songs. And then we pray together and we share community together. But we also share to community together and grow in God's word through different Bible studies and activities throughout the week. And this is a part of our spring 2024 study that we've entitled The Stories Jesus Told. And it's looking at the parables that Jesus told and understanding them, what Jesus meant and what they mean for our lives. Today, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, which is probably a second to the most popular parable that Jesus told. The most popular, I would say, is the story of the lost son, uh, of the prodigal son, but this is probably the second most famous parable that Jesus told, what we know of as the Good Samaritan, the type of parable of the Good Samaritan. So again, go ahead and open up your Bible to Luke chapter 10, 25 through 37. I'll be using the NIV version as we study today. I'll also dabble in the NLT today. Tonight we're looking at this passage, what is widely known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Again, as I mentioned, this is probably the second most famous parable that Jesus ever told. And so as we begin this similar, this very familiar passage this day, I want to start with a reminder that I think is also a challenge, at least a posture for us and how we should approach this teaching of Jesus. Because there are some passages that we are meant to look at. Right, that we are supposed to study, that we are supposed to dissect. And then there are passages like the story of the Samaritan. These passages are actually meant to look into us, like look into our heart, to study us, to dis dissect us and expose any lack of mercy, any lack of compassion and Christ-likeness that might exist within us for any person that we might come across, right? This passage is meant to look inside of our hearts and expose any lack of compassion and mercy that exists within us. So that's the humble, open to receive approach that we need to have when coming to any passage, but especially a heart uncovering passage like this one. So I wanna start by trying to bridge the cultural gap between the context in which Jesus first told this parable and our day. Because the way Jesus tells the story would have ripped at the heart of his original Jewish heroes and expose their lack of compassion and their downright hatred for another group of people. So I'm going to read this passage first from the NLT, as I mentioned. And that just gives us a fresh perspective to this familiar passage, a fresh wording to this familiar passage. And then I'm going to try to bring it home through a modern version of this parable that, that I've actually wrote that I think bridges the gap and brings this parable even closer to home and, and closer to our heart. So first, God's word from the New Living Translation. One day an expert in the religion, in religious law, stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question, saying, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, right, do this and you will live. The man wanted to be justified by his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story, saying a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed by him. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him away to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If the bill runs higher than this, I will pay you the next time I am here. Then Jesus asked a question saying, which of these would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now you go and do the same. Now, a modern translation of this parable. 
On a cold, snowy winter night, a Christian man named Chris traveled from his job in Myerstown to his home in Ephrata on a slick Route 501. The fact that Chris was tired from his long day and that snow was falling all contributed to what was happening next. As he came to the, one of Route 501's many sharp curves, he suddenly lost control of his vehicle, sending him and his car off the road and abruptly into the awaiting guardrail. This was not slight contact that Chris made with the guardrail either. This destroyed Chris's vehicle and left Chris bleeding and unconscious from the impact. Chris was in dire need of help and fast. The first offer of hope came from Chris when a Chevy Blazer's headlights were shown on Chris in his wrecked vehicle. The vehicle was driven by a man named Tyler heading home from a preaching class at Evangelical Theological Seminary. Tyler saw the wreckage and the help Chris required, but he thought, what can I do? I'm just a seminary student. Someone more qualified to help someone in Chris's condition is sure to come along. A few moments passed before Chris's next hope for rescue came. This time it was a Chevy Silverado built, driven by Pastor Travis traveling home after a late night of sermon prep on his message for Sunday, which was from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. However, this turned out to be another moment of false hope for Chris because Pastor Travis was in such a rush to get home to his family that he could not spare a moment to help poor Chris. Pastor Travis kept the wheels of his Silverado right on turning as he carefully made his way past Chris and his destroyed vehicle. As Pastor Travis had passed by, a dazed and confused Chris started to come to, just in time to see the faint sight of headlights in his blurred vision. Chris knew that he was in serious trouble and was longing for these headlights to stop and for the driver of this vehicle to take time to give him the help that he so desperately needed. After a few long moments of watching the headlights approached, suddenly Chris, in his dazed state, realized that he, his, the headlights had stopped coming his way. Suddenly, Chris could not see the headlights anymore because all that he could see was the blurred outline of a man. Next, the sight of this man was accompanied by a voice that turned out to be a professor at the more liberal seminary in Lancaster, Lancaster Theological Seminary. His name was Professor Rose. For Chris, Professor Rose was not exactly the lifeline that he had pictured, but it turned out that he was just the lifeline that he needed. Professor Rose quickly called 911 and then used his jacket to do the best thing that he could to help stop Chris's bleeding. Furthermore, even as the ambulance arrived, Professor Rose could see that Chris was scared. So he assured Chris that he would be with him for as long as it took until he was stable. Professor Rode, Ro Rose rode with Chris in the ambulance to the local hospital and stayed by Chris's side as he received stitches and medical care that he needed. Professor Rose was there with Chris until his condition improved. Chris had the comfort of his family by his side. In the weeks ahead, Professor Rose even continued to check in with Chris as he recovered from his injuries. Now, that modern parable is actually something that I had to write for preaching class a few years ago. We were given the task of taking and writing a modern version of one of Jesus' parables. It was, of course, meant to drive home the same point that Jesus had when he was driving home in his original context in Luke 10, in our more contemporary and with more or more contemporary images. Of course, evangelical seminary, its students and pastors are the best theologically. In Jesus' version, of course, the priests and the Levites were the best, best theologically. Lancaster Theological Seminary, if you know anything about them, you likely know that they are not known for holding the Bible as the final authority anymore, as the Bible is. Thus, in conservative theological circles like evangelical and like we are a part of here, they take a bit of, bit of, of ribbing and a bag of flack. Samaritans were not conservative in their view of scripture either, even holding that Jerusalem is not the proper cent and central place for worship of Yahweh. And of course, Jews, especially the, the best Jews, like the priests, like the Levites, like the Pharisees, they gave the Samaritans a lot of flack, and we know it showed through their actual visible hatred of them. Two examples of poor theology and of a hated group, Samaritans and Lancaster Theological Seminary. But yet, who in this moment, who in these stories actually applied their theology rightly to their lives? And so I hope that, I, and I hope that that helps you see and put yourself in the place of Jesus' original audience and feel the, the twinge that should probably be twisting at your heart right now. Jesus would have told this story and the last person in the world that his audience would have thought would have been the hero would have been a Samaritan. 
So with this in mind, let's walk through this passage verse by verse. Verse number 21, the setup to the story comes. I have broken the passage down into two larger chunks. First, the test of the right answer in verses 25 through 28. So can we come to the right answer theologically? And then the real test, the test of the right application of the right answer theologically in verses 29 through 37. Verse number 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Here we have to see the egregious error of the lawyer right from the start in his question. He gets up the courage to challenge Jesus, to test Jesus, but he tests Jesus with a flawed question from the start. Do you see where his major flaw is from the start? Well, you can't earn an inheritance, right? An inheritance is given, it's not earned. It is, in most cases, a birthright, not a reward. So Jesus is challenged with this faulty question from the start, but Jesus decides to let the lawyer see the error of his thinking on his own through turning the question back around and on him. Jesus says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. A really good answer, a really right answer. And so Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Then he says, do this and live. I want us to see that the lawyer clearly had been spending time with Jesus and listening to his teaching for some time. It's not surprising that he would have answered Jesus' question with that quote from Deuteronomy 6, the, the Shema. That was for generations, for Jews, a summary of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the fact that he adds that quote of Leviticus 19, verse 8, shows us that he has been listening to Jesus for some time. Jesus, Jews were not adding that part in their summary of the law. That was new with Christ. And it's also, and it is almost like he decided, now is my time to shine, right? Now is my time to get my piece of Jesus, my own standing by challenging him before all the people. Of course, though, in his challenge, and here again, in his right answer even, he again condemns himself and he exposes himself. We actually just talked about this two weeks in our Sunday study. If we keep the law, if we keep this summary of the law to perfection, we would be okay. The law of God I'm talking about, right? Jesus says, do this and live. If the lawyer did this, if you did this, if we all this, did this to perfection, we would live. The problem is we can't do this, right? We can't live the law of God perfectly. We can't earn eternal life. We can't earn salvation in Christ. Or rather, it is an inheritance that we do not and cannot deserve. So the lawyer has condemned himself. He knows he hasn't kept the law to perfection, even this summary of the law, and thus he cannot do what it takes to earn eternal life. So his right answer actually condemns him, right? It shows that he stands condemned because he might have answered rightly, but he has not lived rightly. That is what is meant by the law can only condemn us. That the law can only point out our need for a savior in his free grace. And the lawyer is realizing that. And so verse number 29, he continues to want to justify himself, to do right and earn his inheritance by himself. And he attempts to do that through expanding the goalpost, right? Well, if you are to put yourself in the lawyer's thinking right now, if you are to love God and love neighbor, if you have less neighbors to love, that actually makes it easier for you to earn eternal life. What he is thinking is, what is going through his mind is, well, I, I love those who love me pretty well. I love those who are like me pretty well. I love those who I like pretty well. If I can get that to be the measure, then, then I'm golden, right? Then I'm, then I'm set. So he asks that question, who is my neighbor? Bad decision, though, for the lawyer. Because Jesus isn't going to expand the goalposts of eternal life. He's actually going to make them as narrow as possible. He makes clear that through his, through this story, through this parable, he shows us that all are our neighbor. And that we are supposed to thus love all as our neighbor and as our self. That our neighbor is literally everyone. Jesus begins by saying, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. The robbers stripped him of his clothes, 
beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now this would have made sense and resonated with Jesus' Jesus's original audience, like the curves of Route 501 originate for anyone in Lancaster and Lebanon counties, right? This 17-mile path was literally going down because you started out 2,500 feet above sea level and you finished about 800 feet below sea level. It was also a desert and desolate path, a rocky path that provided many opportunities for robbers and bandits to create surprise and sneak attacks. This was, in fact, a regular occurrence, so much so that this path became known as the Blood Path. A longer, a long travel, a lone traveler whom Jesus gives no name, who Jesus gives no background, no ethnicity to, no detail about, would have been the perfect prey. And he's attacked, and he's left bloodied, and he's left beaten. Then a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the beaten man, he passed by on the other side. A priest. Who is a priest? A priest is an all-encompassing religious leader. So Jesus just isn't coming at the Pharisees in this moment. He isn't just coming at the Sadducees, but he's coming at the wide blanket of religious leaders and religious people. One of those sees the man lying by the road, but not only does he not help him, but actually goes to the other side of the road to avoid him. Was he trying to stay clean for religious purposes? Who knows and who cares? He leaves a man lying bloodied on the side of the road, far from the type of love and compassion of God that he is supposed to be leading people to as a priest, as a religious person, as a follower of God. And then, too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Who are Levites? They are really everyone else in the temple, not priests. They were the lay leaders of the temple of this day. In other words, they too were people that should have known better, but they did not do better, right? Right. He too not only does not help the bleeding man, but he walks to the other side of the road not to help the dying man. Now, if you are in Jesus' original audience, you know that a heroine most certainly is coming, right? Someone is going to come help this person. Maybe it's a Pharisee. Maybe it's my sect, the, the Sadducee sect. Maybe Jesus is about to make us, me, the hero. Nope. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Make note that all three men see the same thing. They see the same thing, but they do not feel the same way towards what they are seeing. And their different feelings lead them to go in every way in the opposite directions, in different directions. The Samaritan has pity or compassion on the bleeding man. And instead of going the opposite direction to avoid him, he went to him. And he bandages his, bandaged his wounds. He poured oil and wine on his wounds. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him there. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra uh, cost you may have. This man, this Samaritan, this LTS professor, to put it in our vernacular, went above and beyond to exercise compassion and love for this man. He bandages and disinfects his wounds. He gives a little painkiller in the wine for his wounds. Then he puts him on his donkey brings him into town to an inn where he continues to care for him. The next morning, he leaves to denarii with the innkeeper saying, look after him, and when I return, if you need more, if it costs more to care for this man, I will cover the cost. To denarii, to put it in context, that was the equivalent of two days' wages in this day, and it would have likely kept this man cared for for up to two months. Above and beyond is where the Samaritan went to care for this beaten man. And so Jesus asked the question of the lawyer. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell amongst the robbers? The expert in the law answers, and if this was any question prior to what was key, if there was any question prior to this moment, 
as to what was keeping this man from eternal life and from following Jesus, he answers that question in his response. The expert in the law says, the one who had mercy on the beaten man. This man's, this lawyer's hatred is so deep for the Samaritans that he will not even mention him by name. Right, His hatred for that neighbor is so deep that he can't even say, that he will not even say that it was the Samaritan who practiced and rightly applied right theology, who acted rightly, who acted in a godly, in a Christ-like way in this moment. The one who not only had the right answer that Jesus wanted to hear, but the right application that Jesus wanted to see. Jesus concludes by saying to the lawyer and to all of us all these years later, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. See this. Go and do likewise. Not go and find every beaten, bloody person along the road and care for them. That would be a great thing to do. But make sure whatever it is that you do and everything that you do is done out of mercy. Out of compassion. Out of genuine care for our neighbors, no matter who that neighbor is. What does this story teach us? I would say two primarily things. One, we cannot separate our relationship with God from our relationship with others. Jesus combined love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself because they are one in the same. If you love God, you are going to love his most precious creation. If you love God, you are of course going to love his image bearers. You cannot separate love for God and your love for all of God's others, all of God's blessed and image bearers. And two, compassion. This type of mercy, it does not originate, will not be generated from religion or from responsibility. It will only be generated, it will only originate from our relationship with God. In other words, the point that we see from the beginning is you can't generate this type of mercy, this type of Christ-like mercy yourself. Now, we are not prone to show this type of mercy to anyone. I am not prone to show this type of mercy to anyone, much less to everyone. But rather, we are more like the lawyer than we would care to admit. Seeking to hear, what do I need to do? Seeking to to do what it is that we feel we need to do to earn eternal life, right? The lawyer asked the same question that we ask. What do we need to do to earn eternal life? Rather, what Jesus asks for us and desires for us is what can I do with this eternal life I've been given? What do I get the privilege of doing with this love and life that Christ has freely given to me? How can I show the same love and mercy that I have been shown? How can we apply this study. Remember that we can't earn this. We can't earn Christ's mercy. It is freely given. Remember that you can't generate this type of love through religion or through duty, through religion or responsibility. And even if you could, that is not what Jesus desires for you. Rather, he desires a relationship with you. So, grow that relationship. Have a daily time to plan. Have a daily time set aside. Have a daily plan. And have a daily place to meet with God. To meet with God through his word. And to meet with God through prayer and his presence. That's the story of the Good Samaritan. Thank you for joining us. Again, we do this study in person Thursday nights at 7 p.m. You'd be invited to come and join us and be a part of our study as we continue to grow in God's word together. We obviously worship, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. We're at 5482 Old Philadelphia Pike in in, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We'd love to have you join us. We're also online on YouTube and on Facebook, Peckway Church of Whitehorse. We'd love to help you know and follow Jesus. That is why we exist. And until we meet in person or until we meet online again, may God bless the rest of your day.